Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Manufactured in upstate New York, an employee-owned company, Golden makes the best acrylics, oil paints, and watercolors that you can buy. You can find them in your local art store, or you can find them online at goldenpaints.com. Ellen Altfest was born in 1970 in New York. She currently lives and works in New York City and Kent, Connecticut. She received an MFA from Yale University, attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine, and was awarded a studio at the Marie Walsh Sharp Art Foundation in New York. Ellen has been granted residencies at the Zabludowitz Collection in Finland, the Bogliasco Foundation in Italy, the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas, and led an artist workshop at the Kyoto City University of Arts. Since her first solo exhibition with White Cube in 2007, she's had solo exhibitions at MK Gallery in the UK, the New Museum in New York, and White Cube in London. Group exhibitions include the Royal Academy of Arts in London, the Museum Danteins in Durle, Belgium, Kuka Gallery in Kyoto, the Kunstvornen GL Strand in Copenhagen, the 55th Venice Biennale, the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, Texas, and the National Academy Museum in New York. I spoke with Ellen from her second home outside New York City in Connecticut for a talk about a pretty incredible high school art education, the pace of painting, the value of a residency, Bill Callahan and Cat Power, looking forward to normalcy and much more. Here's our conversation. know is that the ma- there's a mask anxiety there should be like mask anxiety disorder that just creeps into the dream where you're it's just always like I'm having a pleasant time everything's going well like I'm at like some sort of gathering enjoying it and then suddenly like I've left there I'm like you didn't wear your mask did you and then I have like a panic meltdown that like is in my dream and then you know that's that's the most common recurring I, I feel like everyone has that has some sort of variation on that dream who's concerned about mask wearing i've had one where you know really vivid i'm out doing things i'm like oh my god i'm not wearing a mask and it was pure panic yeah exactly that's that's the type of that's the caliber of dream that i'm having as well yeah it was so bad i think my subconscious said all right that's enough you got the point <laughs> <laughs> no no more of that anxiety yeah, that's good. You only have to have it once. I have to keep learning the same lesson over and over again. Yeah, I, th- I feel like um, generationally or, or kind of age-wise, it, there's something about doubling down or tripling down on life events that are traumatic. Because remember 9-11 was so, like for months afterwards, it was just like a news binge that was unhealthy. And yeah. then at a certain point, you know, I had to say, okay, that that's enough. Like I can't. You know what I mean? Like I, I can't just watch news twenty four hours a day for months on end. And I feel with with the vaccine and with, you know, COVID and all that, it's just the same kind of parade of endless anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I, I somehow reacted to Bush by just not reading about all the things he was doing because I didn't I felt too upset. And I was also more into the computer. I mean, into the um, newspaper at that point. So it was easy to just sort of put it away. Yeah. This is the first time that I've actually, you know, have like the New York Times on speed dial or something. I'm like, what's happening now? Like, it's like an addiction. Like, I want the, the negative dopamine rush, you know. Yeah, the doom scrolling, so they yeah, say. Yeah, the doom scrolling. You know, it's, um, and then there, we're already getting the lamenting on how news now is not quite as um, entertaining as it was. <laughs> Oh, really? Last month. <laughs> yeah, just people were saying like, oh, it's so much, it's so nice. Like, I'm not thinking about or having to watch the news every single second or Twitter or whatever. But in a way, there's a little bit of like let down there where people just, you know, it's a train wreck. They wanted to, people want to see a train wreck, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm sure the, the new, new things will come to fill that, um, to fill that. 
um, roll. Of course, there's always crap that hits the fan, right? No, yeah. <laughs> so where are you now? Are you are you in the city? You're not in the city, are you? No, I'm having um, an identity crisis. Everyone has moved to the country, and I guess so have I. But I didn't really mean to. Like I just sort of got stuck here, and for and I've been here for actually like a year and a half or more, like pre, like before the pandemic. Um, because I lost my studio in, the, in New York and I, and I couldn't find one. And then it, it kind of spiraled into um, into just in, into COVID. And then suddenly I'm just like a full-time resident of the country. And, um, you know, I'm, I don't really, I just I'm kind of don't see my, I see myself as kind of a city, having a city component that's is going unfulfilled right now. But I can't, you know, it's not, that's not a real complaint. But yeah, it's, it's well, if it, if it makes you feel any better, I'm in the city and I feel like I'm not <laughs> feeling that component. <laughs> yeah. I it's mean, like it, you're just in a room, basically, you know what I mean? Or you're whatever dwelling you're in and you're basically there most of the time. So it, it's almost like here, you know, neither here nor there. It doesn't matter where you are, really. It's like Zoom is basically where we're living right now. Yeah. You just have better takeout where, where you are. Good point. That's a good point. <laughs> I was stuck outside the city quarantining for a couple of weeks and in New Jersey and the takeout game was way weak compared to what we can get here. So. Yeah. Think about Connecticut. I'm in Connecticut and think uh, the, food, the food here is bland on a good day. And like, you know, try to, to make that fill your takeout needs. It's, it's, you know, it's not the same, but it's six, it's, deg- it's six degrees today. I just wanted to mention that. I just wanted to make sure yeah, I today- mentioned that. Is brisk and windy, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of one of those. I was like, oh, yeah, it is winter because it's been so mild. Brisk is like optimistic when it's six degrees. Like, you know, I, I would say frigid. Right. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And one of our heaters is broken in, in my studio, but um, so, but it's, it's, it's okay. We're definitely doing fine. Now, is your studio in-house or separated? It's above the girl. I mean, I don't know if I should get into my current living situation, but let's just say I'm spending most of my time in my studio, which is above the garage. Um, and yeah, it's a, a nice space. And, and my husband has like built a little office in it too. So that's where I am nice. now. Yeah. Now, wait, why are you reticent to talk about your living situation? <laughs> I don't know. I was going to think of, am I going to talk about this? Well, because we wanted our, uh, my parents to uh, um, be safe. So, um, and then my, we had, this is this, I think this whole podcast is just going to be about Corona and people who listen, might listen to it in, in two months are going to think what the heck, but like, we'll, I, we'll cut it off right after <laughs> this. We'll only talk about oil paint and glazing. <laughs> well, um, my, um, um, so we wanted my parents to be safe. So we, um, you know, we're like, you have to, you know, come up here and this and that. And then my brother got really nervous. He's like, you, you can't be in a house with, with our parents. You're going to kill them. You're going to want to be social and, you know, you, you can't integrate with them. So we're kind of like, they basically have the house and then we're sleeping in a room off the, in a bedroom with a bathroom off the, um, porch and then so and then we spend most of our time in the studio which is you know sort of what I would do anyway and then when the weather was nicer I was painting outside which which was nice um which uh but yeah so it's it's a little bit of a crazy um protracted living situation although they just they just got their first vaccine last week or something nice so you know things are gonna up from that perspective we'll, we'll be able to like retake they'll be able to go back to their normal lives and we'll be able to retake the house after more, more than a year so <laughs> right yeah that'll be great mm-hmm. all right here's the left turn transition out of covid lane into <laughs> art so you're getting are you getting more time to work since you're basically studio bound most of the time and not going out much or you yeah. might have been that way anyways but i mean have you been productive yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was thinking that the silver lining with all of this is that everything is kind of geared towards, for somebody, if 
who wants to be working all the time, everything is geared towards making that more convenient. Like, you know, as I said, like I, I exercise and now there's suddenly live classes, you know, for a monthly subscription and yeah. I don't have to go to the gym or, you know, you know, I'm talking to you via zoom or everything. So in some ways, I think the, the parts of the year that I'm not in, that are out in the country, I'll be able to be so much, it will be so much more convenient if all these um, things that we've developed during the pandemic can continue. So yeah, I think my I, my whole life is around painting and I do, I am somebody who suffers from a small, uh, maybe not so small amount. I'll, I'll stay in, but I'll still have FOMO. I'll have a little bit of FOMO. So, you know, it's definitely, there's no FOMO, you know, no one's doing anything else. You're not like by not going to that your friend you don't have to feel guilty if you don't go to your friend's opening because there is no opening right um that type of thing so yeah, yeah. i think it's definitely going to recalibrate our you know our commitment our level of like commitments and how we feel we need to travel and to be here or there you know what i mean and for those who kind of weren't into it to begin with i think there's going to be a full sort of eject button on that kind of <laughs> lifestyle of like hop, hopping around and traveling here and there you know for the for the people who are hermetic by nature and a lot of artists are i mean this is kind of like a situation you can jive with you know what i mean yeah i mean your studio is near near where you are or it is but i've been doing a lot of work at home too so you know and i've kind of done that anyways cuz i teach normally i teach in pennsylvania 3 days a week so I have a studio there as well and I have a studio at the in-laws in the garage. So I'm kind of like nomadic when I work and I do a lot of stuff on the computer too. So I can work pretty much anywhere. So I'm, it wasn't weird to not, just not be going to my studio every day. That was like that I could work with that. But yeah, my studio is just, you know, right five minutes away here in Bushwick. So yeah, that's ideal. it's close, but I, it's funny. Like sometimes just, if it's late at night, you've been at home all day. There's something nice about just going into the the room in the house that's the office studio and just working in there, you know, waking up with insomnia at two in the morning and going downstairs and making a little work and then falling back asleep. There's something, there's an advantage to that, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that that's something that I'm aspiring to when I move back to get to make something happen like that, maybe. Yeah. So this isn't a permanent, like, out of New York City thing? No, hopefully not. It's just, it's just I have, like, really strange light um, uh, requirements, and they've replaced all the windows in the city with these energy-efficient windows, and I only work from natural light, um, pretty much. I mean, in the, in the or I'll do evening, but m most of my paintings are done with natural light, and so I've really been struggling to find a place that has old windows. Um, and right. that, that was why I, I sort of fell into, um, that's why I fell into not having a studio last year. Um, so I, I have to sort of kind of create my own situation that's like non-compliant <laughs> or yeah. I have to um, find a place, you know, and I think that then you start New Jersey, I'm not going to move to New Jersey, I don't think, but like, they still have the most amazing. They had. They have the most amazing old windows there. Um, still, yeah. still, and people have forgotten that. Like, actually, the function of a window is to let in light. But if you look at the new, like Penn Station or something, the new windows let in, um, and the new energy laws let in for forty three percent of daylight. So you know that building was built with those new energy laws, and it has these huge, um, like the whole ceiling is windows and yet you get absolutely no light through them. So that's, a, a yeah, it's a, it's a quandary because uh, I'm sure you've, I mean, you paint in natural light, but we all know that when they made this transition over to LEDs from, you know, those warm, soft spots that I was used to use from home Depot in the studio to make everything like this nice balance, those they, they've created those lights to be more quote unquote warm, but they're not, they're, they feel like fluorescent lights to me still. There's a sort of white content to them that like bleaches out some color, which is really um, not the funnest to paint to, but it's energy efficient. So there's this balance, you know, between the two. Yeah, I haven't figured that out. Like I, I need to 
figure i i put in all led floodlights in the studio here and it yeah. does feel kind of cold and like i mean there are, i mean the temp not just the temperature but there's something that i can even see in the paintings that i'm doing in the evening that is is a little bit less less than pleasing like and i don't know exactly do i switch back to i don't i i feel like i need like some sort of light consultant to <laughs> you know like like i don't know to but then it's, it's hard to explain because everything i'm doing is illogical to most people they're like wait you don't you want your you don't you don't want your carpets to um fade so of course you want energy efficient windows or you know you don't you don't want to have a lot of electricity so of course you want right. leds so yeah but i'm not i'm not an led i'm not very knowledgeable in, in, yeah it's you know. a it's a quandary right the balance between the two or when you and go like, yeah Sorry. There, I, I was just going to say also too, when you show the work, sometimes you're not in control of that light too. It's such a weird thing. Like if you spend all this time making your studio, the perfect situation to make these paintings and then they, th you hang them in a gallery that just has those fluorescence in there that robs it of its color. It's, I mean, what, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it almost defeats the purpose in a way. That's exactly what I was about to say when I was interrupting you, because, um, yeah, you go in. I mean, I don't even want to stand in those in those openings like with the I mean, I know it's really cool just to have a, like a naked fluorescent light, but yeah. it, it's very it's very challenging. Even in museums, I found um, I don't know. They just don't have those those lights. The right. The, and um, the funny thing is, is this is this is getting really, really painting nerdy, but um, I paint outside and and so when I bring the paint there's so much light outside that when I bring the painting in it, it actually is is always looks really dark and um there was I had a show in Hong Kong and they had this one light it actually had been I think it had been bought by the gallery to light that like Damien Hirst diamond skull so it was this like expensive <laughs> crazy light and yeah. um and i put it on the painting that i made outside and it was like the first time that it that you could actually see the painting um so again i'll just make everything more difficult by like you know saying the only way you know wanting the like a light that that is that bright that is on the painting but yes um fluorescent lights really don't don't do much in terms of lighting paint especially lighting painting too yeah yeah i when I think of your work and just looking at it and then hearing you talk about those conditions, I feel like I want to ask you about this idea of, in a way, like if you were a director, you're, you're making a film and you have to have these conditions that are just, like it's going to be a long shoot. You, your director of photography has got to be very specific. You have to have the right time of day, the light and all that. It feels almost like that with your paintings because if you're painting in natural light and then the the way they're seen and the the detail and just and i i guess i'm i'm gathering that it takes you a while to make your paintings they're not like quick yeah 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 no <laughs> yeah and i've known quite a few people who work that way a slower way of working and there's like conditions and sometimes it drives them crazy like they they have a really difficult time it's like a constant struggle and I wonder, like, do you have that within the process and do you fight against it or is it just like, no, this is the way I paint. This is the way I need them to be seen. And that's the only way it's going to work. So I'm stuck with this. Well, what you would know? what would be the alternative? The alternative would be to screen print, just screen print them all. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I mean, that's your question reminds me of like questions I get in talk sometimes, like where a person is like the people in the audience, like feel bad for me and want to help me. And they're like but can't you just do this from a photograph? Like that would be so much easier, you know, like the idea of balance and practicality. Oh, come on. My question wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I said it reminded me of it. It <laughs> mine went there, but no, I, your question was not that bad. It's just, um, I, I don't know. I struggle. I, I struggle mostly with, I mean, I think on, on the one hand, um, only people who paint, from observation there's like a, a certain craziness to that 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 is very specific to that way of working um you know and i'm i i'm like was very have been very fortunate like at skowhegan to meet 
Backstraw Downs, for example, and and yeah. hearing what he does, you know, and ev- everything that other people do also seems really crazy. Like the fact that you would stand on a street where there's like no access to a toilet or whatever, you know, and people come up to you like he does to me is like you're like that sounds really unpleasant. Um, but I mean, you, you sort of do what you need to do to get the result you need. But the, the part that I really struggle with, um, I guess mostly is, is like remaining, not getting overwhelmed by the task at hand, which actually slows me down. Like, you know, right. feeling like this is going to take forever. I'm not like, I'm hardly anywhere. I can't believe this is taking so like, you know, like not, you know, not accepting, what the painting takes to make and getting sort of frustrated, which actually like leads me away from um, productivity in a way, like, cause like I want to escape the enormity of the task and, and then that affects my focus. So trying to have a, a, an attitude of acceptance is something that I aspire to. Yeah. I guess I, I guess that's why the question gets asked and why it's compelling is that everyone who creates something has a level of built-in struggle with the process or or that's you know part of the content of the work and in some people's work that becomes more evident or prevalent when you look at it than others right so everyone's got a process and sometimes labor intensive aspects of work are just so uh, clear in the work that it becomes you know a, a bigger part of the perception of the piece you know what I mean so that's so asking those questions or, or understanding uh, different artists relationship to that process is is what in a way makes it interesting you know outside of just like oh yeah that's a person but it's like no but it took like this is how I made it and this was the process and and you know it's, since we all kind of do that on one level or another it's for me it's interesting to see um you know, when the work is so tied into certain um, methods or like um, environments or situations to do it. You know, I remember Tom Friedman came to speak when I was a grad student, would come to the studio. He talked about painting it all white and then he would bring one object and just like ruminate on it and then think of something to make out of it. But that kind of very specific idiosyncratic way of thinking about making is, I mean, that's so interesting you know and everyone's going to ask him like oh how'd you make it or you know it's kind of about the process a lot of times but um anyways i don't know i was just i guess interested in your your pace and you know the conditions of because you mentioned natural light the conditions of making that and how that's you know how that works and like how how long i guess that's that annoying question of like when a when the musician's done with the show and people come up to the front and say like, Oh, what'd you use to make that sound and that? What kind of keyboard is that? <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. Like how long do they take? Does it take you a really long time? Do you work on it just only a certain amount of hours to where you can't? Cause they do seem so labor intensive. Um, well, it's interesting that you mentioned Tom Friedman because um, I actually do think about, that piece of his where he stares at the paper for a, yeah. for so, so many hours like i feel that that is kind of like a parallel process to to what i do you know it's like that connection that you have with the thing um by uh looking at it so long like it gives it gives it something um so I mean, and and also like maybe those like tantric paintings are something that I've been thinking of as like a as as sort of like a parallel, like that kind of devotional looking. But I mean, it's really a byproduct of my of my process. I I mean, the paintings have been taking longer and longer, and I I don't know. I want to be um, honest about that, but I don't know if that's I, something that I'm like proud of or I mean it's just I guess it is just is what it is but um yeah like I think that I all I I have been I I think that I've like lost the sense of sometimes of like when thing I, I do know when things are finished in a way but I also think that um I can keep working on them forever and I just keep getting more and more and more 
into them, like things in nature, like I, the thing I've been painting out here, which has been definitely a year and a half, and it's a small painting, um, or not a huge painting, but um, uh, I think um, it just, you could just paint that tree. There's so much in there that you could just keep going in a way, you know, and, and, and you get to one point and then you take it, you can only, it's almost like you can only see what the next thing is to paint um, after you get to, you, you don't see it, you don't see what needs to happen until um, you can only see the step after where you are. So I get to one step and then I see further into the tree or I see more of, of, of what, what's there and I just keep going. And then it just ke keeps, it's almost like a, like a camera lens that keeps get like that you're slowly putting into sharper focus or something like that. And, um, and thin the paintings are just getting more and more like that and denser and denser. Um, and I, you know, I'd love to make like a, a big painting or something like that. And in, in some ways, the, um, I, you know, if I'll keep working, a smaller painting will take me a, a long, a, a long, disproportionately long time. But I don't, I still, I do think that a really big painting would take a, a really long time. So it, it feels like slightly uncertain if I, if I'll do that or not. But yeah, they, they are like, I think I really most enjoy them when every, I think that a lot of the process of painting is is the drawing and getting you know like putting something on and then realizing it's in the wrong place and moving it um over and over and over again and that that's kind of like the frustrating part you know measuring and and you know remeasuring but then once everything is on and in where it should be and that's maybe at like 70 percent of the you know of the process or something like that i don't know but then I can just focus on the painting. And that's a part that I probably, and I have, I don't have the anxiety of, of the emptiness of the, of what needs, what's ahead. And I know that a lot of it, a lot of the, most of the process is behind me, then I can really relax and then enjoy the, the, that part. That's a, my favorite part of the painting, I guess. Yeah. I was going to ask if that kind of, if there is that element of a meditative process to it, that's, fulfilling you know what I mean I get sometimes I I I work really quickly and I don't spend a long time on a painting normally unless it's super complicated but they they're pretty quick they're acrylic they're flat you know um and I'm when sometimes I'll do an image and then redo like mostly on work on paper but iterations of something and I love that meditative process but when I was in school I was doing these fractal grids on paintings it would take me you know, days and days and days of just numbering things. And I love that kind oh. of time in a painting where you can just not be thinking of every move or how close it is to completion and just, you know, there's something methodical and kind of repetitive and, and meditative about that. Um, I mean, I think that I connect more to the discipline of meditation because I think if you, it, when I sit down to meditate, which I want to do want to kind of reactivate that, pro that that process of of doing that or whatever and of meditating but when I sit down to meditate I um it's a struggle like you know because your mind wanders and then you're like and then you have to bring it back or you don't bring it back and then and then there can be an element of blaming yourself like I've, I've just been zoning out for you know unchecked for 20 minutes like and you don't want to have you don't want to be blaming you know blaming yourself for being unfocused so like to me i mean the 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 ultimate reward is that flow state yeah. but there's like a lot of of static and and stuff that gets in the way of that and then when it actually happens it feels amazing but it's um it's it's hard to achieve achieve and um and i'm always struggling with with being focused um as much uh, having as much focus as i as i need to make the paintings right um does is there any connection with your 
Like, well, how did creativity get injected into your life? Like, was it from the get-go? Were you always a drawer? I was, I remember I was a finger painter early on. Like, you know, I got, like, when I was, like, two or three. But um, I think that, I yeah, I was always, um, I think it was, it's been a pretty straight path. I, I mean, I think that that's one of my biggest strengths is that um, I didn't know that I was going to be an artist because it didn't seem like, it was it went against any type of thing of a of a, a professional career path like you know right. it's very unclear but um i think um i was always acting as if i was one um in terms of that was my focus and and there was like you know a, a moment in high school where i was like well i'm not going to be a doctor or a lawyer you know like i don't know exactly <laughs> so i and so then after I guess after college, I, I, re- I was like, okay, this, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. So I think that, yeah, I've always been, um, I don't feel like I'm, I'm particularly like crafty, you know, like I don't like to make like sweaters or I don't know. I'm not like a crafty person, but I've always been, um, art artistic and yeah. Yeah. So when you, like when you were in high school, was art class your class or at that point were you still edging towards the, Oh, I'm supposed to, isn't it funny how doctor and lawyer are the two? Yeah, it's like always the, <laughs> it's always like a doctor, a lawyer or the 5,000 other things you could do. You know, Yeah. I <laughs> Those mean, are always the lead ones, the lead choices. Well, you could be a doctor or a lawyer or good luck with the rest of it. Or I can sell like <laughs> pharmaceuticals or- <laughs> you know, like you don't think of this. Well, I right. think that, um, yeah, I had an amazing, amazing, amazing high school teacher, like who had studied um, Aaron Curzon, and he had studied with Hans Hoffman, who and Hans what? Hoffman had studied with Matisse. So a high school teacher. Like, <laughs> yes. So like I that's had to, rare. I, like college was like a total letdown. I'm like I've already done. I already did all this stuff. Like how many blind contour class? Like every single class in college started started with blind contour. I was like, dude, I did this like sophomore year of high school. Like, like <laughs> how many? Like can you guys get it together and realize that like even within this college, we've already had this class. But um, yeah, we he he started started us um, drawing from plaster casts um like those like flayed men and stuff like you you were there was like a whole curriculum and um i took two classes one w- which was just like um i think a faceted head this was not with aaron this was with robert lahoten and um and and you moved up and i remember that the aha moment in that class was when the faceted head was tilted back and you encountered foreshortening after drawing this head for months and then suddenly he tilted it back and it was like your mind was blown it's like what's going on like with this and then it it moved into the michelangelo head and then we had to take all the these with aaron we had to take all these classes with like um these flayed men and and stuff and then you know sophomore year of high school we went into um drawing the figure like like what what school is this (laughs) It was a magic, the, magic place, like of yesteryear. Was, was um, this like the New York Studio School High School? Where did yeah. you Where did you go to high school? I went to Dalton. So. Oh, so it was a, okay. It was a, that, it was a private school, but um, yes, uh, we weren't. I don't know, but uh, my parents like they would like give their last dime to get us a good education. But like I, I, I mean, I was so lucky that they had such a great art program you know it was it was amazing and um uh, like yeah i studied with him until senior year or i mean he left he retired he's actually still alive he's in um he just turned he turned 100 and not to like last right before the pandemic started so he must be turning 101 now he's in connecticut and what was kind of like the down downside of it was um, not to be too political, but you get your letter from the president. And so he is going to get got his hundredth birthday letter from President Trump. Oh, maybe <laughs> maybe bummer. like, you know, like <laughs> bummer. but it's bad um, timing. <laughs> yeah. So, so but I mean, I had like this classical, this crazy training. And I think that that I think that these things are 
if you want to be a representational painter or, or, or whatever, it it's like your mind, it's like learning a language and your mind, you know, is really impressionable at a young age and to start to, to learn to draw the figure and stuff at that young age was so incredibly helpful, you know? Yeah. Do you now, do you think it edged you into a certain line of creative work <laughs> because you had that really formative early academic? Well, I mean, it's more academic. Let me tell you my high school art teacher who was great. She was wonderful. Didn't study under Hans Hoffman. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, it doesn't sound as, um, you know, as uh, high quality, I would say, or as researched as the, the teachers that you had. So do you think that sort of early sort of um, education, you know, led you into a way of working? Um, yeah. Hard to I mean, know, I, I guess. It, I think it was mapped out for me and I stepped into it. Like, I think that... Um, I think that you kind of have this skill and you kind of want to use it, even though, even that I was, I was aware that at a certain point that it wasn't kind of like the thing to do. It was, it was kind of like an impossible conundrum of like, I mean, later on, like in grad school, like, okay, I, I want to do this. I want to be, you know, painting things that look like things. And I'm not, you know, almost like, I don't know. I, I don't know if my, in a, in a somewhat realistic way. And I don't see that out there, you know, so it, it was kind of, but at that this is what I, ha I, I want to have a connection to contemporary art. So, I mean, it definitely, what's funny about other, other students of Aaron's um, is, is that they, I mean, like one of them is um, Jacob Collins, who started that whole school of like Grand Central Academy and I, I know that primarily because I kind of follow him because I know that he was Aaron's student and it's that kind of you know real like like the New York Academy was too wasn't con wasn't traditional or academic or whatever enough so he had to start so he, so he, his own school so like with Aaron I mean he took that kind of training that he got from Aaron and went in that direction with it. Whereas Aaron was always, we all, there was always like assignments with senses of humor and stuff like that, which I also think was, were important to me. You know, I always understood the um, life drawing and stuff as a tool for, you know, to use towards something else, even though it was so amazing to be, to be doing that work. And, you know, you get into a real flow state when you're in a figure class. Um, yeah, so I definitely think that, I mean, even even in high school, Aaron said, okay, so you're going to go to a liberal arts school, and then you're going to go to Yale. Like, he told me that, like, <laughs> and, then, and then that's what I did. There's a roadmap. I, mean, I didn't know any other schools, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't really, like, I graduated from Cornell, and then I didn't know you know, I wasn't at all connected to art. So I was like, uh, you know, I, I applied to Cal Arts, which was absurd because they would never have accepted me with the work I was making. And I applied to, to Yale because I knew the name Yale, but I didn't know anything about about art, the art world. or And I, I was lucky enough to get in. You know? Isn't it funny back then? Like I think about how I applied to graduate schools and it was just like asking a few teachers and they're like, yeah, there's this place, this place and this place. Just apply to those. Well, like, there really good. wasn't it was wasn't a lot of research involved. There was no internet. There was no, you know what I mean. It was you're just going on word of mouth basically. Yeah, I didn't even have like I just had that one recommendation go to Yale as if that's like so so easily accomplished. You know, like I didn't even have right. other, like the backups. I think I was like I was like waitlisted at SVA, and that, that was like the limit of my understanding of places I could apply. I think. Well, were you taking art courses at Cornell? I was, but I was a little bit underwhelmed by that, by that program. And the building was like, itself was really decrepit. And I actually was like instrumental in getting it condemned because I felt like it was really dangerous. <laughs> and I could be For like a reason. little bit of a troublemaker, you know, like, I don't know, in that, in, in, in ways like that, you know, where I called it the fire department and was like, you guys, this building, like, you know, like it was so like the print shop alone could have like, 
killed you, you know, like the way there was no ventilation and right. Um, so that's funny. I thought that was going in another way of where you were going to say, I, I helped like, you know, bring in resources to make it better. <laughs> You're like, no, I shut that place down. No, I mean, they, <laughs> they ended up renovating it after we, after I left. That's great. And, yeah. um, and it became a, a better facility, but it was really in the shadow of the architecture, even though we were, you know, even though students had to pay normal tuition, all the money, it was the school of architecture, art and planning, and all the money went to the architects, you know, and then they, our right. program was kind of starved. And, um, I actually went on a, uh, uh, a pro, like a year long um, study year abroad in Italy. And I, that's where I learned, that's where I had my next teachers who were very important to me. Um, but at, at Yale, I didn't really um, necessarily connect with, I almost, I sort of almost failed out of the art program because one of my teachers did, thought that I wasn't living up to my potential in printmaking, which, you know, doesn't surprise me since I'm like not good at like keeping the paper clean and like, it's just like being a printer wasn't right for me. And, um, and then I almost failed out of Yale because she gave me a, a C minus mm. and then that was a required class. And so I was going to have to stay longer because of, um, of not having complete like completed that required class that's rough it's funny because like that expectation that if you're an image maker like if you're a painter that you're just automatically going to be able to do printmaking it's a whole different can of worms that's why people use publishing houses and like printers (laughs) you know what i mean it's its own science really it's a, a lot of people have you know it doesn't jive with the way that, and plus it depends on the work too. Were you doing like lithography? Thank God. No, I remember one kid okay, I was gonna say lithography that. was like, it's like a dark cloud that you don't get out of. So I just like <laughs> didn't take that class. This was like a uh, etching, but I wasn't really doing anything really, you know, sh- like some of the kids in there, they get into printmaking. They just live in the print shop. And I think that she like, like that teacher, liked that type of loyalty. And I wasn't, I was sort of like just doing, you know, doing the work, but I wasn't, my heart really wasn't like it, in it. Like, you know, I, I, I submitted everything and it was all fine, but it wasn't like inspired, but yeah. C minus, come on. Like that's, you know, I know it's rough. That's for art class. You need, and you've submitted everything on time. Come on. Yeah, if you show up, I mean, you know, those were different like times. The main... <laughs> those were different. Yeah, that's times. true. That's true. That's true. Um, so, but you found your your painting stride. Did you f- do the thing where um, there was a lot of pushback, and you felt like you kind of strengthened up because of all the, you know, the voices challenging the work? I've I had you know a couple close friends when I was there who painted sort of like hyper realistic and you know they were um you know their their work was kind of like they were in a stage where they were questioning because of course there's all these people going crazy around them with like using this and that you know and they're just making these sort of representational paintings um that there was a struggle there you know but then the, the, they came out stronger because they had to sort of defend the the fort so to speak did you, you go mean, through yeah. that you mean yeah, yeah. um yeah, I, that was Yale was kind of strange because it was the first time I, I'm pretty hard on myself. And then it was the first time that people were harder on me than I was on myself. And like up until that point, I felt like my teachers were my champions and they always saw something um, in me or some sort of potential. But at, at Yale, I, I felt like that I was like met with kind of um indifference like they didn't come down hard on me but like they didn't they were just like yeah keep doing what you're doing whatever and that was that was a little bit um challenging in a way you know to right to have that that shift that shift but like i had been doing stuff that was like it was like you know the 90s when i was in at cornell and it was kind of like that feminist like i don't know like we were sort of taught that um that that like women were always like kind of like the victim or i don't know victim is like too strong a word but like you know that the women women were 
in the weaker position and and everything was sort of seen like you know art history and everything was seen through that lens and also so i was making work also that was had more of a maybe more of a feminist bend to it or something or i was painting like about something coming from a female identity and and i think that they liked that at, at yale and I, I wasn't aware, I thought I was just painting my own experience, but I realized that it was really filtered through this things that I've been taught in, in, in an undergrad. And when I realized that they're like, keep making this like feminist work. And I, I didn't realize it was feminist. And, and I realized, oh, I want to make it um, more specific to me, but not about being a woman in general so i let right. that go that was helpful that was that was it was sort of a reaction to them being like we like this feminist stuff and i was like oh i i didn't mean i didn't necessarily mean to i am a feminist but i didn't necessarily mean for my work to be you know see like have that easy read of like just okay this is a, this is a feminist statement or something right it was um, you would have imagined it was more embedded in the process of you as a person and not a tagline to the work, like this is this or something. Or like, you and know, was, I'm, yeah, I'm painting my experience as a woman, but not, as, right. not like, I'm not necessarily representing all women or something like that. Yeah. So know. how long, how was the, um, well, you went to Skowhegan a few years after you graduated, right? Because I've, you were, ADL before I was, but you, I think you went to Skowhegan after I did. When did you mistaken. go? I was there in 99. Oh, I was there in 2002. That was like a life changing. That was such a great Wasn't experience. It? I, I love Skowhegan. Me too. It was yeah. great. It yeah. was the great remedy for, see, I went right after grad school and I had been applying to it because in undergrad, one of my teachers went there and she sang the praises of Skowhegan and she would say, listen, I applied to this thing year after year and it takes a while. So I had that mindset going in and I did that. I applied and I didn't get in for a couple of years. And then I got in um, right after grad school and it was the perfect anecdote to coming out of um, grad school for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I got in after my seventh try. I was definitely, I was definitely, pers that was the one thing, like I was pretty good at get, being rejected from things. I, I felt like I was never going to get into McDowell or Yotto because they did the last, I was painting landscape and the last thing they wanted was like a landscape painter and, you right. know, like they were way too, that wasn't conceptual enough for them. And, um, but, and I, so if I, I would get rejected from things and I would, I was very resilient, but like every time I got rejected from Skowhegan, it was, it was definitely a sad moment. Like, cause that was the one thing I, I really, really, really wanted to, to where I wanted to go. Yeah. Was that just from hearing other people's experiences or what you imagined it would be or, or was it the people who were, you know, the, the participants in the residents or a combination? Uh, um, I don't know. Maybe it was just some sort of like, intuition you know like that that i mean i think probably because of talking to participants and yeah just that that knowing that it was this like good good thing you know that that you you know sometimes you just know that there it's a good thing like like I, I won't read like i don't know if this is a parallel but i won't read like movie descriptions but it, like before i see the movie i just like if there's a consensus that it's a good movie i just go and i think that there right. was just this like overwhelming consensus that this is like somehow amazing you know and and right, so right. i just knew that out of every i mean you know i'm sure mcdowell i haven't been i've been to Niato actually but i haven't been to mcdowell and I've, i hear good things about it and i'm sure it's the same way but like yeah skowhegan was was it for me and it, it turned out to be um so important in so many different ways that like over many years so many things sort of stem back even like maybe i mean i guess as as much as as yale but it, it feel it feels like you know this you know i always recommend everyone to apply and reapply to that i guess after a certain age you have to kind of that's it but yeah like i i, I think it's such a great thing to do they don't let senior citizens. Yeah, in. like <laughs> if you're in the senior, I don't know. Nowadays, maybe you know because people are always rediscovering senior citizens. Right. 
Yeah, no, it was, I mean, was it transformative to the work? Or do you feel like it was just, you were kind of in your groove at that point? Because you had been out of school for a while working. Five years, yeah. Um, I think that, oops, I think that it, it was, um, I went there with a certain, like, I was wanting to find a certain rock, and I found it. Like, it was like, I was in the same, I, I since I've listened to so many Sound of Vision podcasts, I was, like, getting psyched up to do this which I don't know if it's helpful, <laughs> helpful or not, but like, you know, in terms of talking to you, but um, yeah, they're very, it's something similar actually I did at Skowhegan where I listened to all the, the talks that they had up until that oh, point. Oh, the cassette while I was tapes? Thinking. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah. And, I, and I- That was great. Yeah, but I feel similarly with your podcast, like it's, this podcast can be so, can be very distracting, but hearing somebody talk about their process is, um, is a different frequency. But um, yeah, I went, I was in the same, I was in the cow pasture like you were yeah. and I love those cows. And, um, and I would look at, and right behind the cow pasture, there was the rock that I had in my head that I was going to paint. So in some ways I did do fulfill what I wanted, but in other ways, like I, I had like Rob's store and Rack Straw Downs in, and like, I was completely leveled by Rob's stores, like withering criticism of of how i was making the work and i i wasn't taking it the thing is is that work demands what it demands and i I, the i was painting faster but and the work was thinner but it wasn't it needed it needed to be um have more um be more resolved than it was like it wasn't necessarily succeeding at that level of finish or whatever so that was pointed out to me, which was painful because I had a show opening that fall and most of the work, you know, was made already. So I had this knowledge <laughs> that the work was like somewhat inadequate, got, but there was nothing I could really do about it at that point. You got the review before the show was up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and yeah, like it was like, I, it was like the Rob store was one of those few, few criti- critical, like, I'm, as I said, I'm really, I'll, I'll keep working no matter what. But like after Rob's store, like there was definitely at least, you know, 24, 48 hour period where like I just couldn't go back in the studio. Oh, no. The shell shock after. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He was like, he'd be like, what, like what work like do you think your work relates to? Which is always such a hard question. At that time, I was just like, who do I know who's a painting representation? of I'm like, I don't know, like Elizabeth Dayton and John Curran. He's like, your work has nothing to do with those painters. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're probably right. That's I don't know why I said those painters, but um, yeah. You didn't go with the uh, me. I'm original. There's no one like me, Rob. I didn't know what to say. I did not know. What I'm to one of a kind. Say. I was not popular, but um, I I um, but he, and then did you so, say I was not popular? No, I was. I wasn't. <laughs> well, like I was. I wasn't unpopular, but like I think that um, what the 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 really hard thing that Rob, I felt like I was already professional. I thought I was a professional before I went to grad school. I thought going to grad school is kind of unnecessary but um I didn't know what else to do but with um you know I I definitely after five years out of being out of grad school I'm like I'm like you know I didn't realize it was a school like so much like you know and Rob Store's like let's take your palette let let me see your palette and this was like hugely embarrassing you know what I mean like what's going on like you know there's something going wrong here and so he like like started looking at my palette to see like He's like, look at what a mess your palette is. Like, you you need to organize your colors. Like, everything's just everywhere. And I was, I was just like humiliated. <laughs> I was like, oh, like you know, going brass tacks. Like, I'm not, you know, I need, I need like some sort of ground up advice here. Like, it was, it was. But I, in some ways, I felt like after all that, I was like, well, maybe everyone needs to go to Skowhegan every five years to like, you know, so because at a certain point, people stop telling you the truth about, you know about what you're doing like you know you you have to pay people to tell you really like what they really think about what you're doing or you know what i mean like, right, so I, right i'm sort of over that i don't really want to go to scout again every five years anymore but right right after scout again i saw how how important you know i needed to learn those things at that time oh I, I wonder too because it is a, a program that's so different depending on the you know the people who are coming that maybe that year was specific because like my year I don't think this is going to sound weird. I don't think I learned anything (laughs) like from a, you know what I mean? From a, like a sort of painting 
standpoint of like a formal thing. This is people who just came in and just talked to me about what I was doing. You know what I mean? It was, oh, this is cool. Yeah. Well, what's that? You know, and it wasn't any, you know, if someone was going to critique my palate, it was going to be brutal. Like, fortunately, no one talked about that. You know what I mean? It was just, um, it didn't feel quite so, um, but I think that might have been just him and, and different people come in. Like, I, Tom Friedman was there when I was there, and I, I don't remember, I remember when he left my studio, I was like, what just happened? Like, he, we, it was so cosmic, the talk, and it wasn't, re- I don't even think it was about my, I, it, it was, I, I was baffled afterwards in the most wonderful way. I was just like, that, that was not like any other talk about my work I've ever had, you know. But it didn't, and like, then I had it didn't a, make an impression. It didn't like lead you to do something different or anything like whatever, like, you know, I don't know. I think it did. It just, it recalibrated what I thought um, people talk about when they come to a studio visit. That's what it did, <laughs> which was kind of a beautiful thing, you know, because yeah. like in school, it's so, it's a job. You know what I mean? Like the professors come in, it's their job and they're like, I've got to sort of like ask questions of this artist and make them think outside of their box and try to, you know, make them stronger by thinking more broadly. Yeah. And, um, it was just, it it was a different thing there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I also heard this one story that uh, like is just always in my mind, a, a Scavigan story, but it's not my, it wasn't my story that um, Alex Katz came up there to give critiques. And um, he was talking to one of the, the students at Skowhegan and he, and he looked at the student and like, and it's like, well, how old are you? And the student said, whatever, 35 or whatever. And he's like, ah, you know, I think, I think you should just, just pack it, like pack it in, you know, <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> I always think about that as like a possible, a possible, like if I would ever, you know, give or, that critique or whatever that that seems like crazy <laughs> so he was saying that as like you should give it up you should give it up like yeah you should you should my, the pack it in is like an expression that my father brought over from the bronx you should you should you should um you should give it up oh yeah. no no i i i i i know that expression but i meant in the sense of like um you're too old to do that uh, like or you miss the boat is that kind of what he's saying no i think it's sort of like if you're you're not any your work is at this level of good like you know at this age you're really never gonna get to you're never gonna get anywhere i mean if you haven't made something that shows more promise than this does at this point just like forget about it got that, it that's sort of what i interpreted it to me and alex bring in the realness yeah, so it could have been worse than looking at my palette, but, um, you know. Yeah, those tapes were great. So, okay, so we talked about Skowhegan. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't talked about music yet. I mean, is it something yeah. you're... I know you, you've you listened to this before, so you know it's coming, but are you a music <laughs> fan? <laughs> How could I be on your podcast if I wasn't a music fan? Uh, there's a few people who I'm always kind of surprised but they just don't like or listen to music which is you should pre-screen you should pre-screen i really should i know my i someone there's this adage of like don't trust people who don't like music i don't say that i don't i'm not saying that but it just is odd when people don't like music yeah um i i definitely i remember i remember like being on uh, on like david humphrey's radio show many years ago and he's like so I would have imagined that you would like classical music, which for some reason I found like greatly offensive. Like I was like, <laughs> he thinks that I'm like, just like some like, you know, like, like a- academic painter, like listening to like classical music and just like, you know, <laughs> replicating what I see, even though, I mean, it's totally fine to listen to cl- classical music and it's actually a great accompaniment in a figure drawing class I find. Right. But, yeah. That's so funny. He just pictured you and with like Bach playing in the studio and images of Angra all around you. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. I have to say that I do like um, Ang. Like uh, so. Uh, so maybe that part is is valid. Is true. That's that's valid. You but know, I have to stand by that. I would have thought that not necessarily classical music, but probably like Aaliyah. Or maybe, uh, I mean, maybe like big pun in the studio. 
I, you know, I don't even know Aaliyah or Big Bun. <laughs> okay. But like, that, that's the sort of, maybe that, am I embarrassed now? No, like, that was kind know? of a joke. But um, what do you listen okay. to in the studio? I mean, I've been I've been having like a love hate relationship with listening to things recently because I, my phone addiction can will kick in, um, touching the phone. But like I I tend to listen. I was talking Chia Fwaki, who I know you know, said like said observed that I like like either when the person is kind of it's a music where that you feel like the person is talking directly to you, like. I had like a major like love affair with Bill Callahan, like, oh, things yeah. that are things that are lyrically driven that have like the would be goods. I don't know if you know them, but like things with like really smart people with like really like interesting lyrics. And then I like things that kind of um, drone, like I'll go back to like Stereo Lab where there'll be those long instrumentals and, and you just get and you're just painting and you're just into it, you know, that type of. The ra- that kind of range of I've tried other things that like kind of artificially um, bring you to a level of focus, but I, I you know, I'm not so I, I like things that are actually like musically cool and interesting, not just like having certain beats that like get you into it. Right, right. Into it. So you're like maybe the lyricism of your paintings relate to uh, a love of lyricism in music. I'm stretching. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my mind is like exploding. Like, I don't, I don't know. I know that there's been like a long, if I, if I, you know, was trying to think of like my musical history of what I liked um, up until now. And I think that like, you know, the Bill Callahan strain will like uh, um, tap into like where you like fall in love with a musician. You're like, I love Bill. I love, like you just have a little crush. Like I had that with like my first crush was like David john davy jones oh right from the the monkeys monkeys. yeah but like i mean that was in repeats when i was young but like when i was like five i asked for that album and and i would just like kiss the album cover repeatedly because i thought he was so cute even though i didn't realize at that point because of the repeat situation that he probably was a lot older than that album cover but and then kissing the vinyl kissing not the vinyl but the the album cover. Right. See, we have more in common than we even knew. <laughs> <laughs> Why you did that too? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Who 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 was who was that for you? Like Stevie Nicks or something? Davy Jones. <laughs> Davy Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And then and then I like had a sting moment. And oh my um, goodness. Like it was. I mean, that looks that seems embarrassing now. And I definitely was off off a like as soon as Sting started talking about his like interest in tantric sex, I like I felt like that was TMI, and I instinctively moved away, which was which was good. Like I was only with him for his first couple of solo albums, well, but like police, the police stuff is super like you know sultry. I think. Yeah, the police is is good. Um, I know, like, it's funny because I don't listen to that, but like, if I ever do, I realize, oh my god, I know every word, right? Because I listen to it so. Much. But like, I'll tell you my one music story because I've been saving this for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell this to many people, but um, okay. So I was in high school, like I slept. I didn't. I don't know if I slept, but I stayed outside Radio City Music Hall to get tickets to see sting it was his like first album it was like so i think it was i think he might have been touring with branford marcellus at the time i'm not sure but what record is um, that just sorry for the aside might have been like the dream of the blue turtles that's not the um, one with saint agnes and the burning train right i think i was off the scene with saint agnes and the burning train like by that point because i don't remember that okay but, but um and I remember like being, I was there so early that I was like in the second or third, maybe the third row. And I remember Andy Warhol must've been the end of his life. And he was in the audience also. And like, there's something very like democrat, you know, like there's something about um, Radio City Music Hall where, you know, people are all together. Yeah. And he gave me an interview magazine at that point. Like, Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I just like said, hi. I was like, I was like, I, I'm a fan of yours. And he, he didn't say anything to me, but he was with somebody who had a stack of interview magazines and he handed one to <laughs> At me, the show. <laughs> like, just like give it to her. Like, right. you know, he was giving them out to, and then I told my friend who I had slept online with or whatever, and she went over to him and he didn't give her one. So oh, it was like, sort nice. of a letdown. I, I kind of got through, but anyway, so there was this moment that, um, everyone, uh, stormed, 
the the stage like i mean maybe like six people ran up on stage uh-huh um, um, during the concert. And I always thought I was above that, like that I was going to be, uh, um, you know, that I would never do that. I didn't want to be perceived as a fan to sting. Like I wanted to like sting to like respect me, like, you know, I'll, I'll meet him one day and he'll, he'll like, you know, he'll respect what I'm doing and I don't want to be a fan. It's right. too embarrassing. But, but I saw like, it was like the Red Sea parted and there was just this, this like clear, path to the stage and somehow I was just like drawn I was like I just was like walking onto the stage and I was like suddenly I was like right behind Sting on stage wait you got uh, how did you how did you get up on stage I mean like the stage was really low at Radio City Music Hall so you just hopped on it was like there were like steps up to the stage there were like 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 three shallow steps up to the stage so I walked on the stage and I mean, this is like, I'm in like, you know, high school, yeah. like maybe I'm like at the beginning of high school anyway. So, um, and so I'm behind him and I, I realized that people were going to say to me like, well, did you touch him? <laughs> like, you know, like I knew that that was going to be like, if I had, I was, I didn't want to let people down. Like if they said like, did you touch him? So like, I remember Stanton realizing this and like just reaching out like my pointer finger and just like, like lightly touching his jacket. <laughs> and then like, which was this like really, really expensive, like, grainy grainy linen that was like you know and then i just like ran off the stage like after completing my mission like i wasn't gonna like try to like do anything crazy to him right and and then i was like escorted back to my seat by one of the guards so i didn't even like have any penalty for and then people in high school like this was totally out of character so people in high school were like was that you on (laughs) stage last night like there were other people in the audience like you know i think we saw you on stage that's funny so that was my my one like fan fan moment and you didn't wash that finger for a week right that was the old... no, I mean, I had no real interest in touching him, clearly. Like, it was just, like, an obligatory thing. Right. So I'm sure the finger got washed right away. <laughs> the sting finger. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, did you go through a Elliot Smith phase or, like, any of those other singers, songwriters? Oh, yeah. The Elliot Smith was, like, irresistible. I mean, because you feel like it's like that personal connection where you feel like um, that you can... Um, help him or that you know that he becomes like you have that like female like helper gene where you're like i can he needs me or or something like that and your heart goes out to him but really maybe it's not the healthiest um thing to be listening to over and over (laughs) and over And, and i remember seeing him like right at the end of his life like in this really really small club and somehow like and it was a free concert it was like something that was just announced at the last minute and somehow I knew about it. Um, I was like going to a lot of concerts then. And, um, and, and that it was, it was sort of sad because like the, he wasn't like playing up to his like normal level and, and, and the audience, they hadn't paid or whatever. And they started heckling him. Oh boy. And um, it just was a really, it was really sad. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a good, feeling you know that was the only time i saw him perform actually which is crazy because the amount of you know people who are so indebted to his music and you know for him to feel like you know oh people just aren't into it it just seems crazy doesn't it yeah not having the defense to like get it you know get it under control either you know what i mean i'm sure that there's a i don't know yeah he was yeah just had that kind of vulnerability of being open to that level of mistreatment by the audience it was it was something i'd never seen before either you know yeah that's rough i mean his music is so um you know i had a friend who listened to it all the time and it would like it's amazing it's, it's the sound and the sensitivity, you know, the emotion of it, but it is brutal at the same time, just in the same way that, you know, like Philip Glass can be brutal yeah, in a different way, it, but it, of that kind of like, if you listen to it all the time, it might not be healthy for you. <laughs> that's how I felt. I mean, there was, there was one moment where it became conspicuously apparent. Like I had these like healthy couple friends come visit, stay with me in New York. And I was playing that, that music. I can't remember the line, but it's like a really damning line that he was singing and um and they had this look on their face like 
is Ellen really in a good place? Like, you know, I could, I could see the concern, like, you know, like having, have, playing this music and them being like, you know, checking in after living somewhere else and being like, I don't, I don't know what this, what's going, like, what's going on here with her. Yeah. That, that sort of, uh, audio compassion. We've all had those friends growing up. We listen to Morrissey so much that you're like, is everything okay? You're right. <laughs> or, or yeah, or cat power. Like oh, that can, yes. like that can sometimes you can like get. In, like I also went through the uh, the cat power. I mean, the greatest is is like one of the like amazing, amazing albums. But if you, I was listening to certain things on on repeat with that and um, or with her music, and that can also be um, not the healthiest. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we. I the band I was in played a show with her and she just seemed um impenetrable as far as like you know i mean she would talk uh, i just heard her say a few words but she just seemed to be in her own world and i imagine a lot of those i'm sure a lot of the musicians that you kind of connect with that kind of you know whether it's from like bob dylan to you know someone like you know um chan marshall to and those those kind of like singer songwriters that really seem in their own world you know because it's so raw their connection to what they're singing about yeah that's true i did i was able i did meet her once she said that she liked my hair that's nice that was that was a nice moment yeah um I, yeah i think that she yeah she that's a you know a rough you know uh <sighs> that's a um yeah like a a she has some ser- some that's a hard place to to be in you know you know what i think is an interesting parallel i don't know if you agree with this um with artists it's just so much of our time is spent in the studio by yourself usually unless you have a ton of assistance but usually you're by yourself in your world creating this and you're connecting with these ideas in a one to one way and then there's this weird side aspect of the gig that is like going out to an opening or to socialize in that setting, which I think a lot of times might not be in sync with being by yourself a lot and being that outwardly social. And I think a lot of musicians have that same thing where, especially those raw emotive, like I think Kurt Cobain was like that, you know, although, although he performed really well, there was an aspect of seeing him on stage where he was clearly just not comfortable being looked at by a ton of people. And I think that only seems to add like fuel to that fire of the sort of discomfort of the situation, you know, and it's weird, like with music, you can write music and release it. You don't have to go out and play, but it's, it's so much a part of, you know, making sustaining as a musician. Yeah. And then there's people Uh like Funkadelic where it's like performing is, you know, everything it's just, you know, wonderful and it's a celebration and, you know, so it's funny how that's, the relationship between, you know, and then there's artists who are out there all the time, just working it and love chatting with people. And it's, it's an interesting dichotomy within, you know, creative fields, I think. Yeah. It's funny as an artist and you see a musician and you're like, how do you do that? You know, any, you know, I, I even look at my other artist friends and, and think that, but in terms of, I, I find that I'm, I, I have like a really social person in me, that wants to get out like you know but is like it you know, my work doesn't let it happen that much but it is really disorienting like you spend years in this like gritty grimy you know or in the woods or whatever and then suddenly the work is done and you're at, at your opening after many years and that's the most disorienting thing where you're like suddenly clean and you've had your nails painted as if you're a woman and then like you know and 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 it's like the work's on the wall and it's just odd. You Isn't know? It? Like, yeah, it's like showtime. It's like for a Broadway actor there or actress, they're always in the spot. Like their creative expression is tied to the performance of it. But it's so it couldn't be more uh segregated as an artist for for most people, you know, if you're just in your studio working by yourself and then hey, once every year and a half or two years you pop out of your hole and you know, say hi to everyone. It's like it can be awkward. It is weird, but I do feel like I, I feel such joy if I go like if right now, if you if I was at an opening with friends and stuff, I would think I would be completely elated because like my social energy can get easily depleted. But like it's like so backed up that like, you know, just going to an opening and seeing people would 
actually be it would be so nice right now I, you agree. Know, I would love i would love it yeah i think we're all feeling that right now actually to be honest too just going out and freely seeing art where it's like a casual not worrying about like oh do i have to like make an appointment or call ahead and you know be screened or <laughs> you know what i mean like the temperature check at the door and all that and to just go walk around like we used to to be able to like bump into people would be so nice i think yeah, going. I've been to galleries and um, to see shows, and I, I just it is so it is really nice, even as it is, you know. Like, I, I just I'm, I, and I want to see that David Hockney show at the Morgan Library. Yeah. Although I wonder if that's like a great if that's like a COVID friendly environment, but like, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, going to see shows can be so amazing and the community i love the com i love running into people and and that's such a great part of our our world like that there is this world where you see like new york can be so cold and then you see you have these people that you see and you enjoy seeing and you just happen to run into them it's the best in this yeah it's, yeah it's the best yeah i love it now even you know when i'll go into maybe galleries that i've talk to someone who you meet those people and to have that relationship too of just saying like oh hey how's it going you know and being able to talk about the work with people it's it's such a nice thing you know it's you don't realize how good things are until it's taken away i think yeah i'm like i'm looking forward to um to that you know to seeing people i really i do miss i miss like even you know in the country or whatever just going to hang out with people any 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 kind of perm um, permutation of like seeing people would be a welcome, <laughs> like would be welcome right now. Definitely. So what do you, like, what's your schedule now? Do you work, are you working pretty much every day and do you have anything coming up? Or are you just working on a body of work? What's your schedule like? <sighs> um, well, yeah, I start off with like six thirty or seven fifteen class and I use those classes like exercise classes, yeah. live classes. And I use those to get myself out of the, bedroom and then i um i'm basically working until i have like a daytime i'm wait making watercolors for a online watercolor show nice so um i'm basically working on daytime watercolors and then i have nighttime watercolors and there's no place to go so i'm just working until 10 p.m um so i'm, I'm definitely working a lot um and but you know it feels good you know it gives me a sense of purpose and I, I actually I think that deadlines are like are for week, like weak weak people but I need deadline like you know having a deadline getting through this is helping me get through this winter like and giving me a sense of purpose and um, I'm really grateful for having having I'm, I mean it, it's a little bit strange to have a show online you know but um, it seems like of the moment. And I think that if you're going to have a show online, like water, like works on paper seem to, you know, probably work well. And, and uh, it was funny because like Hillary Harkness was telling me that she was making like stamps, stamps, like paintings on stamps. Oh, wow. And like she said, you know, like making so you can make something this small this you know, it elevates something this small like you know um the, the computer yeah, you know and sure. i and so i've made like i'm making um paintings of uh like uh, i made an acorn on a man i'm working with like the man's skin and the and the um moles and everything and i've enlisted my husband since he's the only model i can have but he only gives me like three hours a day so I'm not only working with a model two or three hours um so but i use like like his moles and stuff as like compositional elements and um and like you know the acorn is tiny and so i feel like it will get like a little bit of its own you know moment by being online whereas like i feel like works on paper tend to be like not uh, as valued in in normal in normal world right. in the normal world yeah yeah so no, i get it that makes sense. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Do you have a tentative time frame of when that might be happening? Yeah, it's um, April 19th. Oh, that's an exact time. <laughs> I don't know. I, know. I, 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 I sort of wanted to know the, the date, so I asked ahead. No, that's great. Um, and uh, so we can maybe spread the word about that whenever that's going to open. 
Yeah, we'll see. It's like a little bit of an experiment. This online, this whole online exhibition situation. I did one because yeah. I was working on collages, and it was great. You know, it was cool because, you know, the majority. I mean, when you live in the city in New York, you feel like the hometown. That's your. You have a show. You see the people there and stuff. But there are a ton of people who see your work only online because they can't go to where your show is. So, you know, it's great to have that sort of. Um, you know, that audience, that broad audience. And for me working on small collages, it's like, like you were saying, when you see them on the computer, you can really see the detail of it well. And there's something nice about being able to see the physicality and zooming in like that. So, you know, it's, yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see your collages because I love collage. So that would be cool. If you should, I feel like you should link that to, in, in this podcast. Also. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I'll send you some images. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for talking today. It was fun. We finally yeah, made it fun. happen. I think we talked about it a long time ago. I know. I feel like it's the pandemic. It's like everything made it happen. It's good. I'm happy. I'm glad. It was great. Thank you. Sound of Vision is recorded, edited, and produced by myself, Brian Alfred. You can find out more about the podcast by going to soundofvisionpodcast.com. You can find images on Instagram at Sound of Vision Podcast. Many thanks to Golden Artist Colors for their long standing partnership. Check out their new sofa paints. Many thanks also to Ellen for taking the time to speak with me. Brigine, who you're hearing now for the intro outro music, and Michael Lovett for the introduction. Please go to iTunes, rate, review, and share the podcast with anyone you think might want to hear it. Many thanks for your support. Time to flirt with the